Carmen Callo is a famous actor, screen star, director and impresario who has also written an important study of Orson Welles. I thought a good way of starting to talk to the biographer would be to ask him how his gifted subject could have come to so much grief. So how did he screw it all in the long term? And it's the long term started quite early, didn't it? When he really lost control of Ambersons. And almost immediately, actually. Almost immediately. Uh, um, uh, but, but, I mean, there, there are, of course, many, many answers to that, uh, detailed, complex ones. But, but in a nutshell, uh, in, in my view, the, 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 the essential problem was that he was a man who, who, who lacked internal discipline, needed it to be imposed on him externally, but deeply resented that. Mm. So as soon as anybody even so much as murmured the word no at him, his hackles rose and he began to get seriously um, megalomaniac. Uh, uh, he never, he never ever found a producer, for example, that he could work with. He loathed John Houseman, uh, precisely because Houseman would say, "No, Austin, you can't do that. You, you, you can't do that. You mustn't do that. We can't afford it. It won't be possible." One sympathizes deeply, but there is a point where that becomes just infantile. It does seem to be a problem basic to the creative personality. Creative personalities are usually very large egos, and how they control their ego is eventually. Decisive, mm -hmm. and uh, you take a man like Lawton, for example. Mm -hmm. and I think Lawton was a truly great man, and he uh, made one of the, the best movies ever made, *The Night of the Hunter*. Absolutely. And you think, why didn't he make twenty of them? Yeah. Well, he wasn't really in control of his career, and it's very hard for an actor to be in control of the things he does, isn't it? Absolutely. I mean, there's a very good reason why Lawton didn't make uh, another film because it, that was a complete disaster commercially, an absolute flop, and so. Uh, nobody really wanted to invest in Lawton as a director. And also, he was old. Remember, uh, at, well, at the time, he wasn't old at all. He was 56, but he was only five years away from, from the grave. Mm -hmm. He didn't obviously know that. Uh, he didn't have the energy. He didn't have the stamina. Wells was made of adrenaline. <laughs> uh, uh, Lawton was a very different kind of a creature altogether. He was slow revolving, you know. And uh, uh, he, he, he kind of nurtured and bred things. Wells was a creature of will. He made things happen. And Lawton suffered, didn't he? He thought he was ugly, for example. Yeah. Well, everything's complicated, isn't it? Uh, I, I came to believe that his ugliness was a kind of technique that he used, both as an actor and as a human being. He used it to impose himself. He, he, I, I believe that what artists sometimes have to do is to, is to find, it's, it's rather like that damned bit of grit in the, in the oyster, you have to find the thing that leads to your best work and then, then emphasize it. And he found that, I, 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 nobody uh, reports that Lawton as a young man before he went to Rada uh, was awkward or difficult or disliked his own body. But once he discovered that that was a root to uh, extraordinary performances, I think he emphasized it tremendously. Mm -hmm. And he made big public statements about it. But in fact, he also was very famous for taking all his clothes off and running yeah. around naked. Now, he can't <laughs> have disliked his body <laughs> that much. <That's> right. <coughs> yeah. But uh, even Lawton, a, a great creative talent, could control the circumstances of his career only up to a point. And he did have to spend a lot of time making movies they didn't really much believe. I think he ended up with Bud Abbott and Lou Costello, and he was playing Captain Bly, wasn't he? Yes, but he liked that. <laughs> See, he, he loved slapstick comedy, and one of his dreams was to be a slapstick comedian. He thought the clowns were the, were the, were, were the greatest of all. Um, yes, he was curious. I'd rather ruin to the point I was going to make, but I'm going to make it anyway. It, <laughs> it seems to me for actors, they divide into two, well, they divide into 100 categories, but two categories are obvious. There are an actor such as yourself who have all kinds of skills and can write and produce and and you can create circumstances in which you can shine. And then there's the jobbing actor who takes what's going. And in many ways, it's much easier to be the second kind, isn't it? Yes, I suppose so. Um, uh, except that there's a real gift in what the jobbing actor sometimes does, in turning completely ordinary material mm -hmm. into something rather individual and special. Mm -hmm. Um, whereas the great creative actor generally needs the material there mm. to work with. So, it, uh, in other words, uh, in fact, I think it was, uh, this is Lawton himself said this, that the, he, he, he had one or two, there are two kinds of actors. Uh, uh, <laughs> there are the, the, the kind of actor who puts on a coat 
and makes it look as if he's worn it all his life and that it was tailored specially for him. And then there's the kind of actor who puts on the coat and becomes the kind of person who would wear that coat. Mm -hmm. And it's it's quite an interesting good physical image that because it, it suggests in the other the, the second kind of actor which is what he was an ability to submit to a character and to give in and to let go of yourself that's paradoxical of course because you think of Lawton as being tremendously um, uh, formed you know you have a strong sense of who Charles Lawton is but in fact if you look at his work even some of those lesser films, his powers of transformation are absolutely mm -hmm. astonishing. From Bly to, to the butler in, in, in Rutgers Red Gap to, mm -hmm. to, to Javert to, to that astonishing senator that he played in Advice and Consent at the end of his mm -hmm. life. They're, they're absolutely extraordinary reformings of himself. Whereas, I mean, the kind of actor of whom you speak, we might say Cary Grant. Yes. Uh, I, I can't say that I... I, I, my admiration for Cary Grant is particularly less than my admiration for Lawton because what he did was um, a, a thing of such beauty in the manner of what Fred Astaire does that whether he transforms or not is kind of almost and he irrelevant. Chose, he chose well too, which is important, isn't it? You just can't take anything. Yes, mm. yes. There's one the story about Grant that I love is, uh, and I understand Clint Eastwood, whom I admire rather less, but still <laughs> yes. you have to pay him tribute does the same. Grant would actually go through the script and take out any line which was exposition and, and give the exposition to the other actor. <laughs> Very he wise. just wanted to react to it. Yeah. Oh, quite. Absolutely. <laughs> Apparently, well, that's intelligence, isn't it? That's not just taking <laughs> yes. the job. Yeah, that's yes, actually it's very controlling smart. it. Yeah. Yes, yes. Yeah. And I suppose that's one thing star, star power can do. You can control your circumstances. Yes, uh, although, as you rightly said, Lawton, in the end, couldn't at all. Yeah. He, he tried on several occasions. He became a film producer, but he... he he produced three films in the in the thirties in England, which uh, just didn't work at all. Um, uh, he 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 was a stage director of of, of extreme brilliance, um, but 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 because his movie flopped, he was unemployable. I think. When you were sitting there in the stalls when young, and seeing your first actors, what kind of stalls were they? Theatre stalls or movie stalls? Was it the movie actors that first attracted you to the profession? Um, it, it, uh, yes, uh, um, the, f the, the very first, my first awareness of acting at all was in a theatre, and that was Peter Pan. Mm. Uh, and it, it, it was, um, I mean, it's, it's a, a family myth that I was, uh, I w uh, it's not a myth, it's a true fact that I was an intolerable, impossible child, <laughs> hyperactive and uncontrollable. And on this occasion, I, I was screaming and weeping outside the theatre. It was cold and we had to queue and things like that. And the instant the lights went down, I fell into a, a kind of hypnotic trance and just sat riveted by this and fell in love with Captain Hook, you know, and immediately... Same here. He was the one I wanted to be. Yes. Yeah. I, I saw it at the Minerva Theatre in Sydney in about 1954 when I was tiny. <laughs> yes. And Captain Hook was the one. Yes, yes, I'm afraid so. <laughs> Peter Pan meant nothing to me. But it was... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> he was the one. Yeah. Um, uh, 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 and indeed, I, I'd, uh, there's nothing I'd rather do than, than, than play him. Uh, I'm sure it could be a rare. Yeah, sure. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, was that the beginning of your theatre-going habit? Did, who did you see next? Yes, uh, then, uh, but for some reason I can't, I, I, the, the, I didn't s seem to go to the theatre at all after that for a long time, until in fact uh, I, I went to live in Africa uh, when I was nine, and uh, the, we saw the local amateurs playing Simple Spyman, the, the old Brian Ricksfast, and then the heard what I thought was the funniest line in the world, which is that uh, um, one of the characters was called Forced to Stand, and he would say, I'm forced to stand, and they'd say, oh, I'm so sorry. <laughs> I thought this was, it was my first sense of... There was uh -huh. a solitary peal of laughter from the audience. <laughs> exactly, <was it>? yes. <laughs> I thought, this is good. No, the, the, the audience, <laughs> the good, solid Rhodesian audience uh, um, fell apart, and I thought, that's rather good. I like that. Yeah. I'd like to do some of that. But I, I really... The main acting that I saw was my own in the mirror, because oh. I, I was uh, um, uh, 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 unstoppable. You had it by instinct. Yeah. Uh, uh, totally. I I, I I I I wanted to be somebody else. That was for sure. I I I, I, I went through my grandmother's wardrobe um, uh, at a very early age, mm -hmm. and then uh, every every birthday and every Christmas, all the presents that I got were cost costumes. You know. Uh, particularly under uh, some affection, a policeman's costume. Which, uh, 
What did you use for written materials? <laughs> <laughs> Were you writing your own stuff? <laughs> Even then. <laughs> I was I was certain I was improvising. I was in the Commedia dell'arte tradition at that <laughs> stage. <laughs> and uh, uh, yes, uh, um, I, I read voraciously uh, plays, particularly in Shakespeare's plays too, um, without understanding them at all. But I read them out loud, which was a very good thing to do. Did you memorize speeches and that sort of thing? Yeah, poems I memorized, yes. Oh. Yes. Uh, I, I remember the I think probably the first poem I ever remembered was one of the Rubaiyat of Omar Khayyam. The moving uh, finger right. No, it was that the other one. Uh, <laughs> Come, fill the cup, and in the fire of spring, the winter garment of repentance fling. The bird of time has but a little way to fly, and, and lo, lo, the bird is on, on the wing. wing. <laughs> <laughs> My mother was very, very strong on the Rubaiyat, and I learned the moving finger right and having written it as on. Right. Yeah. It, I think it's probably a very, very good poem to get early on because it's got the uh, it's got the pentametric rhythm yes. beautifully, hasn't it? Uh, yeah. Absolutely. I'm a big believer in learning poetry early for, for all. Uh, I, I, and, and anything, really. I mean, prose is rather wonderful to learn, too. Uh, um, just to get in your brain and, and feel it on your, on your lips. But uh, that's all, as far as I can see, the passivity of modern cultural experience yeah, is yeah. the <coughs> biggest problem in the sense that, that, that we have. I mean, there are, there are in, in innumerable problems in, in the performing arts financial and, and otherwise, but uh, the fact that the audience no longer does it themselves anymore means that they don't really, um, they don't, they're not really in a position to judge it. They, they, they judge it from a purely cerebral point of view, but they've never been there, just the same way that b people, you know, you, you used to play piano duets at home or sing on the piano and all that kind of thing, so they actually had some idea of what was going on out there. I actually noticed it in the theatre. I noticed as, I've been here 40 years now, and uh, the, the, the grasp of the rhythm of, spo uh, of spoken language, yeah. the grasp started to slip, even with the actors. Yeah, uh, oh, uh, uh, absolutely. You get quite a few actors who can't, don't, haven't really got the rhythm of Shakespeare. Uh, oh, oh absolutely. Uh, they haven't got the rhythm of anything, <laughs> because, the, because language is increasingly less rhythmic. Uh, um, uh, people no longer speak in completed phrases. They, above, they certainly don't phrase in paragraphs. I, I mean, I have friends of a certain age who speak uh, as if uh, they were uh, en engraving a text. It's extraordinary. <laughs> it's a very lost art. Nobody talks like that or, or is able to listen to that anymore, it seems. What was the first time, apart from Captain Hook, that you sat there in the theatre, presumably here, and saw a great big-name actor actually doing? Uh, well, um, on, on film, there was uh, Olivier uh, as Richard III, and then later Lawton as Casimodo. Th those were the two that... that, that uh, Richard III was one of my there. first... Uh, I went to... When I was at school, I went to see uh, Olivier in Hamlet on film. Yes. But I didn't really get it. Yeah. Uh, I, I was laughing at the cod pieces, actually. Richard <laughs> III got me. Yes. Yeah. Yes, Captain yeah. Hook. <laughs> it is. It's exactly <laughs> the same performance, basically. <laughs> and... Uh, uh, um, uh, and uh, uh, everything about it, the, 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 the sexy danger that uh, yeah. Olivier had. Uh, the Perfectly uh, believable when he seduces Claire Bloom, isn't it? Absolutely. Yeah. Oh. Uh, ev ev every aspect. Yeah. I mean, it was mm -hmm. extraordinary the way he possessed that character, yeah. or it possessed him. You know. um, but, and Lawton pr pr presented something completely different, because yeah. with Olivier, the, the charm of Olivier, even on film, was that it always looked like acting. Yes. Yeah, Lawton uh, was something else, although it was on a huge scale. It, it, it unnerved you because it was, uh, you kept feeling from time to time, should I be hearing this? This is too intimate. The, the scene with uh, Maureen O'Hara on, the, on the, the, the roof among the gargoyles is, is almost unbearable. It's, uh, he plays so delicately. Yeah. It, it's almost a whisper uh, and very light and, and, and almost playful, all that pain. Harder to do in the theatre, of course. Uh, uh. Well, they I say. I'm, uh, I'm, I'm not sure about that. Uh, uh, Lawton himself had a rather erratic theatre career. Yeah. Uh, he, had a, he was the, the, the most exciting y y young actor of his time when he left Rada for about four years in London. And then his acting on stage was very intermittent. He, he came back to the old Vic and so on. But it was said of his um, Angelo in Measure to Measure at the Vic in, in that 19... 33 season, that he somehow had brought the art of the close-up 
uh-huh. into the mm. theatre. But I think, you know, actors had always done that, mm. uh, Irving and so on. It was a, it's, it's in a way, it's a, it's a sort of curious old trick that if you, w- there are two ways of getting people to listen to you. One is to shout very loud, <laughs> and the other is to talk very, very <laughs> quietly indeed. <laughs> and, uh, Do you actually see some of the film stars, uh, when they get famous enough, actually pulling that trick when they're interviewed on television? Yes. Speaking softly. Uh, Lee Marvin at one stage did a whole interview and you couldn't hear him. Yes. <laughs> And the idea was to prove his star status, and it did, too. Yeah, well, absolutely, yeah. and, 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 uh, but it's actually true. I, I've acted with actors, Paul, Paul Newman, uh, amongst uh, others, uh, who speak so quietly on the set that even the microphones can't pick up what they're saying. <laughs> I mean, they would beg him to speak a little louder. <laughs> but, of course, he knows that it'll just bring the, the, yeah. the camera closer and closer and closer to him. I suppose when you, get, when you got to London... Yes, did you back to London. Back to London, yes. From... Africa. Africa, yes. Did you head straight for the for the old Vic and the, yeah, st- the stamping ground? That's yeah. exactly where I went. But the, the old Vic at that time was not a theatre of stars at all. It was a, it was a, a company of sort of medium ranking actors. Uh, they had had star seasons earlier, but not by the time I got to it. it was in its sort of fag end. Uh, the star thing for me just started with Olivier at the National Theatre, mm. and then that that became for me the the definition of theatrical excitement. It, it, it was, it was uh, an absolutely unique enterprise. When I look back on the early 60s, I realize how lucky I was. I was fresh off of the boat from Australia, where the only Australian who ever got off, got off the boat in an English winter with an Hawaiian shirt. <laughs> and I got lucky straight away. I saw Olivier as a fellow down at Chichester. I saw Gilgud on stage. I saw them all. Yes, they, yes, were all yes, they were all there. They yeah. were all there. Yeah. And, and, but, and, but also, um, particularly in the case of uh, Olivier's Old Vic, they were there in conjunction with the sub- subsequent, the cream of the subsequent generations. Mm. So there were the, there were, there were the, uh, the m- actors who'd already made names for themselves, like Maggie Smith and so on. And then there were the young, uh, young Hopkins, young Jacoby, young Gambon, all building their way up through the company. And that was the glory of it, really, mm. is, is the, the, the depth of the casting was... Breathtaking. Well, many a young man and a young woman has sat there and looked at all that and think, I want to do that. Many of them. And many of them are wonderfully motivated and intelligent, but they don't all make it as actors, do they? The failure rate is colossal. Mm-hmm. Uh, you did. Uh, wh- wh- what's the secret? It's not just application. First of all, it's a gift, and then it's application. But you've got to be in the right spot at the right time. You've got to. Yes. Uh, the, the usual cocktail of ingredients, you know, opportunity, m- luck, uh, modicum of talent, uh, all of that. I think the most underrated uh, uh, quality, and I think you'll find it in the career of everybody who's been successful as an actor, is intelligence. Mm. It's, it's, uh, it's very tough. Uh, uh, demanding of the brain, mm. acting. Uh, um, not necessarily, it doesn't make actors articulate in themselves, it doesn't make them particularly profound as thinkers, but it, you, you do need to come to terms with language, with, with words, with thoughts. You know, you're, you're more than anything else, acting is thinking somebody else's thoughts, more than feeling somebody else's feelings. I mean, the feelings, as it were, follow on. If you can get your brain inside another character's, inside a character's brain, then oh, pretty well everything else will follow. You're a walking refutation of the common assumption that an actor is a vacuum waiting to be filled up by a passing personality. <laughs> uh, you've got plenty of personality of your own. But is there something to it? Has there got to be a malleable condition in the centre of the soul where you can, you can just put yourself aside and become something? Yes, yeah. absolutely. Uh, uh, th- we are shapeshifters that's what we are and 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 we 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 m- must be interested in that in uh, what you might rather poncily call ontological flexibility you should say that again ontological. <laughs> mm. i always wanted to have someone on, on television with me who could use a phrase like ontological flexibility <laughs> okay. well, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> definitely not sending you up just great <laughs> But it's uh, um, so you 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 have to. Um, I, I think the, the the basic process for m- most people of growing up is finding, developing a personality and sticking with it. Mm-hmm. Uh, the 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 process for most actors is um, uh, having acquired a personality, then to, to d- then to try to f- find a way of, of of getting behind it and under it and and exploring the possibilities mm-hmm. that you might have 
um, experienced had you not settled on that personality. Someone smiles as you, do you get bored doing the same show again? I mean, the only drawback of the theatre surely is that if you get it right on Monday, you've got to get it right again on Tuesday. I've never got anything right yet, so um, I, I, I haven't suffered that problem. Uh, you, you, there are certain, uh, I mean, I if the material is not in itself nourishing, then then it does get... Has it ever happened? It is like being sick you on an empty stu stomach. stood up there and thought, God, Christ, I'm wasting my time here. Oh, <laughs> have I ever? Have I ever? <laughs> now, that I do try to avoid now. That I, that I really... Uh, that's exactly what you look at. You think about it, well, is this going to... Is, is this going to sustain me, even for a, a, a week? You know? so, whereas movies, of course, uh, you don't have that problem. So you can... <laughs> <laughs> do material that is inherently um, uh, non does the, movie, does the movie spoil you for the stage in that way? No, I, it's just really nice to be able to move between the two because they're, they're so different in feel. The, the sensation is completely different. The, the point about the theatre is that it's always an art of projection, whereas when you're acting for a camera, there's nothing to do with size of performance or, or a volume. But uh, you, you must always somehow s swallow the camera. You, you've got to sort of absorb the camera into your ambit. Uh, you, and you mustn't, Wells said this very well, uh, he said the problem with Larry as a film actor is that he tries to dictate to the camera. And you can never do that. It's often said about him, isn't it? But it actually works in Richard III and to a certain extent in Hamlet. But there are ordinary parts that Olivia played where you can see him projecting into the one device you don't have to project it. Yes, in. that's yeah. absolutely right. Uh, um, because when he when he didn't do that, then he was quite mm. astonishing. Sometimes yeah. uh, there's a there's a film that they made for the Festival of Britain called the m I think it's called the, the Magic Box, which is which Magic is Box about William Freeze Green, William Freeze marvelous book, and he plays a Marvel. Bobby. He's terrific. He's yes. astonishing. <laughs> the man, uh, Bobby's b the only man that Green can demonstrate yeah. uh, his new invention yeah. to, yeah. and his uh, the the vulnerability of his expression is just glorious. Remember very well. Saw it in Australia 45 years ago. Remember right. it now. <laughs> right, right, right. R Robert Donut, fantastic. Yeah, yeah. 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 You've, um, is, is there a British film industry or is it a branch of Hollywood? No, I, I don't think uh, it is. It's, it's not it is a fil film industry of its own, but it's not quite the film industry one would like it to be. But that's, as usual, it really does just come back. Well, I was thinking economics. of Shakespeare in Love. There you are in the middle of it. So I think it's a marvelous picture. I love Shakespeare Charming. in Love. Yeah, it was great. But eventually the shots are called from Los Angeles by... by oh. If you trace it back, mm, yes. the power is there. Isn't it? But, but uh, on in that instance, uh, he trusted Tom and he yeah. trusted uh, um, John Madden completely. Mm -hmm. Uh, and I don't think there was any kind of interference, whatever. Um, uh, that was certainly wasn't the impression one had on the set. Uh, but what, what I just rue is the absence of the kind of film that Ingmar Bergman made. Yes. That's, that's my idea of really grown-up cinema. Why can't it be done? You, surely you and a few people like you can set it up. All you need is millions and millions of pounds. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, That's exactly. the problem. Isn't it? <laughs> well, totally. yeah, there's no, and, and uh, Bergman, no domestic market you can make yes. your first. Berg, Berg, Bergman got a very, was a very uh, you know, unique position because he was immediately recognised in Sweden. As and they all speak Swedish. <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> right. Well, isn't that the problem here? Is that it's the, the it's distorted by the fact that we speak American. Yes. Yeah. I'm sure that's absolutely right, and uh, the danger is that we we impersonate ourselves, as it were, mm -hmm. for for an American market. But of wi and you might indeed say that of Four Weddings and a Funeral, but nonetheless, Four Weddings and a Funeral is also a film of great charm. It has been uh, better, Four Weddings and a Funeral, but I loved it. Yeah, I think it's yeah. delightful. I think it's not inauthentic either. I think it, yeah. it is. We are like that to some extent. Yeah. It's a it's in a great tradition of English comedy. Yeah. But there's, I suppose, there's no changing that. I'd like it to happen too. I I've often thought how marvelous it would be to write and direct for a, an industry in this country. The Australians have managed it. Yes, they extent. have, remarkably. Yes. With a very small population, only 20 million people in Australia. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, um, but for some reason, they don't feel obliged to become... Uh, they, they, apart with the obvious exceptions like Crockett Dun Dundee, they, they, they don't seem to feel obliged to present a pantomime of, of, of Australian life. In fact, it's strictly ballroom. If it had been under Hollywood control, it wouldn't be the way it is. And no. It's one of the reasons it was a hit in America, because a special audience thought it was yes. unique and strange. A and it is. Yeah. And it's, it's, it's a gorgeous yeah. film. Uh, absolutely. Have you got any projects like this up your sleeve by any chance? 
I, I have a film that, I, that I've been wanting to make since I was 15, therefore long before I became an actor, but a director or anything else. Uh, uh, Christopher Sherwood's Mr. Norris Changes Trains. Terrific. A subject. great, great, yeah. great comic novel, one of the, the, the great comic novels of the 20th century, and a very rather uh, important and, and, and uh, disturbing one as well, because it, because it pits this fabulous, picaresque uh, uh, rogue ag against uh, the rise of Hitler in, in a very striking and disturbing way. So, finally, you Santa did. Claus has given me my wish, and uh, I'm, uh, I've written the screenplay, and uh, I uh, hope that we're going to be in production next year in Berlin, in of all places, the studio in Babelsberg, which is the old Ufa studio where they made Blue Angel and all the rest of it. Is this the first the world's heard of? You're, this is the first announcement, right? Here. This is the first public announcement, yes. yes. <laughs> <laughs> you heard it. A scoop. You, you heard it here first, please. <laughs> uh, well, that, that, <coughs> that, that's wonderful news. And, um, but yeah. it certainly is. We, 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 the world. I, I've made one film before. I directed uh, a film of The Ballad of the Sad Cafe. And uh, that wasn't such wonderful news, but that was very... Cars very and the colours. Yeah. We used yeah. to call it the salad of the bad cafe in Sydney. Yeah, of we course. <laughs> <laughs> but we were joking. <laughs> Simon, it's, I hope this is going to be the first of many conversations. I certainly want to have a conversation shortly before you start shooting in yes, Berlin. Absolutely. And perhaps shortly after. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> shortly during. And uh, more about Wells and Lawton and all of them, too. As a, as a, if, if you didn't act and just wrote, you'd be having an important career. It's just a pleasure to meet a man of so many... So many Gifts. Thank you. Simon Gallo. <laughs>